Welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series, your resource for the latest news and updates on pressing issues facing the accounting profession. Good afternoon and welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series. We're coming to you live from AICPA Council, which is in Chicago. We'll be talking a little bit about that in a moment. I'm Eric Auskerson, one of your hosts for today, and we've got a great show planned for you. So we're going to be talking a lot about some you know, breaking news as well as you know, strategies and capabilities. So here is the agenda for today. Uh, we're going to kick things off uh, with an update uh, from the fall council meeting. We'll give you some of the key takeaways. We're then going to do a DC and profession update, move into our technical update section. And then we're going to talk about work transformation and kind of work, you know, managing people in this new environment that we're all working in. And then we'll have our usual open forum and closing remarks. Apologize for a little bit of that uh, side noise if you're hearing it. Uh, here are the lineup of presenters. And to kick things off, I'm going to discuss with Barry a little bit about what is council and maybe give the audience some background. I'm sure many of them are familiar with it, but I'm sure some may not be. Well, everybody's got a lot to keep up with, you know, and so they, you know, you focus on the issues that you need from a practice and maybe not how the organization actually runs. But council is um, is a body that's really representative of all of the states. Every state has a, has representatives based on the number of CPAs in that state. Uh, and we come together that comes together twice a year, really to provide input into our strategies and also uh, to get a, a variety of updates. And and literally 75 percent of that group. Uh, comes collectively through the state society process. So for most states, it'll be their chair, a chair elect, et cetera, that is here. And depending on the size of the state, some additional people who might have been past chairs and things of that nature. And so it's a, it's a gathering of people who are actively involved in the profession from a, from a governance and issues perspective. And then, of course, a big part of that is they go back home and they they work with state societies and chapters and committees and, uh, you know, in their own firms and employers, et cetera, and, and really talk about the issues of the day and what's important and um, and provide that two way communication. And we're really uh, excited, Eric, to have today with us not only a participant in that council, but a participant in our recently completed uh, executive roundtable in which the we gather the leaders in a similar way to council, but from a, a corporate perspective, the leaders of businesses, uh, particularly technology businesses that interact with the profession. Uh, we do that on an annual basis. And Calvin Harris is with us, who is now the CEO of the New York State Society of CPAs. He was actually at the executive uh, roundtable in a role of CFO, providing some dialogue on a panel there and, and some communication. So. Uh, welcome, and we look forward to, we, we'd like to hear some of your takes on your first go around in this process. Yeah, well, thank you, Barry, I'm, and I'm, I'm really glad to be here. And I have to admit, for a, for a kid from Oxon Hill, Maryland, uh, to be the CEO of the, the oldest CPA society is pretty heady stuff. But you're right, I did have an opportunity to go to um, two of the meetings involving the future of finance, one in in Nashville last year when I was the chief financial officer of the National Urban League. Uh, and now in this role as CEO, got to sit in on a panel uh, just last month. So it's, it's it's been interesting just seeing the different perspectives you have when you're in industry thinking about how you're gonna manage your staff and make things go through there versus in the CEO role where you have to think a bit more globally in terms of what's best for, for the entire state and the profession. And what did you think of that uh, collection of um, talent from all of those technology companies coming together and talking, you know, about the direction of the profession? Yeah, I, th I think that's really one of the most interesting things, really, because uh, next year will be my 25th year of, of being a CPA. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm a proud CPA as well. And if I think back then, technology would be the thing. You'd be excited if you had uh, a very large computer <laughs> that you got to carry around in a, in a briefcase. But now we have so much power just within our, within our pockets. So it, it's very clear and obvious, whether it's data analytics majors uh, or IT majors, as we're looking at them as well, that technology is, is clearly where the profession already is. So it's, it's, it's really exciting to see so many technology companies actively involved. Yeah, I mean, let me just jump in. And we did have a special uh, session uh, of the town hall live from that executive roundtable. And what that executive roundtable is, is we bring uh, together a, 
group of leading companies to talk about how they're investing in their solutions to really help transform the practice of finance and accounting. And we always have a panel of firms. We had a panel of, of, of finance professionals. So Calvin, it was great having your insights. When even over the last couple of days here, we've been talking about you know, business transformation, evolution of services. So, you know, compare maybe a little bit of the discussions that we've had here with what we were talking about uh, in New York. Yeah, I, I think it's really a continuation, just like you said. The, the issues that we have uh, within the profession aren't necessarily new ones, um, but we, we do know that they, they need continuous uh, attention. So it's good to, in, in many ways, to hear the same uh, items come up. Mm -hmm. And we know that we're thinking through and we're not just trying to look at them as as individual issues. We're trying to look at, at them globally. Uh, but it's clear we're going to need to have continuous discussion with as many stakeholders as we can to really get some movement on these areas. Well, Barry, one thing that is was, we, we, uh, town halls, when we bring up talent, we get lots of feedback, lots of questions on it. That was a big topic here at council. And what I, what I was energized about, and I, I had a panel discussion today, was just the role of the strategies and, and technologies and building out capabilities in the firm and how that then helps you build out uh, a winning culture. But I, I know you've got other kind of summary takeaways and you know, this is it's an important feedback session for you. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that you know, if you look at what everybody was talking about in this sort of gathering of people from all over the country, uh, clearly what's happening in the government side in Washington and, and, and state regulation as well, but uh, skewed more to Washington today. And, and of course, Mark is here with us and is going to talk about that. Um, human capital was clearly, as you said, Eric, yeah. in everybody's mind. And then the evolution of services, not only services like DAS and, and building that out in a firm, but we had topics on tax evolution. We had topics on even accounting, 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 audit, services. accounting services and accounting and auditing services. Um, and of course, sort of peppered into that whole environment was sort of the frustration with IRS services as it relates to what we've talked about here on town halls over and over and over and over again, which is highly frustrating uh, for the profession as a whole. But back to the human capital element, you know, I think, you know, human capital is such an emotional issue because it's a lifeblood really of people and how they work in the profession. But, and it's true, one of the panels we had was to, to equate that to not only a public practice element, but also the corporate element. You know, the human capital challenges sort of span that. But it also, it, human capital in today's world is not, not really focused just on, hey, what's happening in the CPA profession? It's really a macro issue. I mean, there are more than a million less students in colleges and universities right now than there, than there, there were just two years ago. Um, there is almost a 20% decline in enrollments in community colleges than what there were um, just two years ago. And so there's this, this number of, of people who, as young people say, I'm going to further my career ambitions through a higher education lens. And that has changed very dramatically. And when that happens, we get our share of that as a profession. And then I think the other part of that, though, is there are a lot of pieces, parts inside our profession that goes with that. And we have a, we have a, a profession wide involving the state societies, the regulators, the academe world, firms, the institute, really looking at, you know, a, a profession wide notion of how do we close this gap? How do we fix some of this? And many people here are, are participating. They're either employers of, of people in the corporate world or they're employers from public accounting and various size firms that are on this town hall. Uh, and, and really firms and the culture is what you mm -hmm. led into this, Eric, is the yeah. culture inside firms, what people perceive to be how you work. Uh, frankly, compensation compared to where the, prof the profession sits to other employers is a huge part. In fact, we put that sort of culture that CPA environment of firms is really the number one influencer because firms are on the front line with people. They're hiring them, they're coaching them, they're advancing them, yeah. et cetera. Now, the ancillary part is what happens in academe, what happens in the recruiting of people out of high school, which is predominantly a state society responsibility. They're, they're on the front lines. What we can do to have bridge programs to get people from different disciplines or different ideas into the profession those are very critical components as well. And then even the state regulatory process where, 
you know, how you sit for the exam and all of those things. And all five of those have to come together, sort of, sort of marching in unison to try to maybe disproportionately win our share of this smaller population of people in the, univer in the university settings. Well, Lisa's going to have a, a session that she leads here in the town hall about just talking about some of the feedback we received related to the workplace. But what what's I mean, there's so many different elements that go into human capital and talent. And I, and I, I think one thing that I was struck with today is just, you know, some of the firm leaders saying just the importance of of the work you're doing and how the firm's managing that. So we can talk about compensation and all these other elements, but is the workload manageable and and, and how is how is that work life balance being supported? Yeah, is the work life is the workload doable and is it work that is interesting right. and challenging and are people being invested in to develop the skills that let them do even more of the work that matters to them and to their clients? You know, a, a lot of what we hear from firms is that people just want to know that they have meaning within their environment, within their firm, that they're able to make an impact with their clients as well. Um, that they are going to be given new opportunities, that they can grow, expand into different service areas. You know, client accounting services and advisory services are, are very attractive to a lot of people, but so is creating your own niche in crypto or specializing in, in digital assets or SOC reporting or diving into ESG. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we got into a little bit of that being an employer of choice on the last town hall with Sue and, and Mike Decker, and that's a lot of it, giving people work that is more than just what I did when I was a SAP accountant, you know, footing trial balances and reconciling cash. What else you yeah. got? <laughs> so, Calvin, now so you all of a sudden, yeah. you're just a few months into this role here leading the New York Society, and that, so you're hearing these issues, yeah. you've, you heard, you, you felt these issues in your, your CFO role. And, yeah. and I, early in your career, I found it really interesting that you, you, you led a, like a virtual CFO or accounting yeah. services practice as well. Yeah. I, I did. Um, I have a, a, a pretty interesting background, I suppose, varied. I, I began, like so many others, in public accounting. I started at Arthur Anderson and uh, really enjoyed my experience there. But I realized that being part of uh, not-for-profit and higher education, which was what many of my clients were at Anderson, was where I fit in best. So most of my career was really spent in, in, that, in that area. Uh, interestingly enough, as you talk about the, the CFO services, it was roughly 10 years ago when I was actually living in Maryland that I sat down with the, the then head of the Maryland CPAs and saying, you know, Tom Hood, of course, saying, I'm doing this work, this fractional work, and I'm not sure how my society, my association is supporting me. And, and we started having discussions and we broke it all out. So I, I find it really interesting this week to see, you know, client advisory services and CFO services showing up because back then there was just a handful of us looking at it. And, and now it's a, you know, an entire line of business that, that I think is still growing. There's a lot of opportunity, whether you're in big firms or small firms. So it's, it's really interesting to see that coming, coming full circle. And to knit that back into the human capital and to some of the things that Lisa said, and, and look, human capital is gonna be an issue that for this country, and it's not just this country, but we're focusing on this country. It's, I can tell you, it's a worldwide phenomenon right now. But the, the human capital element has a lot of moving parts and it's not easily solved. So what Lisa said was, you know, finding their niche and, and finding different ways. I think it's very important for our profession in this transformative notion to understand that the generation that's coming out of or coming into the workforce, let's talk about it from that standpoint, is going to be motivated where they see purpose. And, you know, it's it's political in this country about how we think about ESG as an example or different aspects. But that purpose driven aspect and how the profession profession fits into that resonates. The data clearly shows that that resonates with the, with the people who are 20 and 21 and 22 and 23 years old. And I think it's important as employers that we have we have the ability to communicate that and then how we work, which is we'll talk about a little bit later, but the flexibility notions and uh, et cetera. And, and it is a generational shift that is occurring. We have this huge number of baby boomers. The profession really grew from a numbers perspective in the, in the very late 70s, but predominantly in the 80s and early 90s. That's with the explosion of numbers. And you just do the math. That's a huge number of people who are nearing or, or at retirement. 
And so it's a generational shift, yes, with two generations in between those two from a numbers perspective. And the profession, and you referenced it, Calvin, with the sort of the in intervention of technology 20 and 25 years ago, the profession changed immensely since that period of time. And it is changing now. You know, those of us who are at or near retirement, we won't recognize the profession in 20 years. But the people who are 20 years ahead of us, they didn't recognize the profession either when it transitioned. And so it's really part of a natural generational shift that's occurring and purpose is very driven. Now, this profession has a really great story to tell about purpose. You know, this trusted advisor role that you talk about all the time, Eric, as, long, as well as all of us appear to, uh, is very important. It's the lifeblood of entrepreneurial business. On the bigger end, in the public, in the big firms, the, the, the capital flows that occur from the capital market system, because there is a rigorous audit process that minimizes fraud in the system and allows the access of capital to all sorts of businesses. Just taking those two examples, there are huge elements. And then you throw in things like ESG or the evolution of blockchain or anti-fraud capabilities. So is, is, it's, a, it's, a, it's a matrix of things that are going on. It, absolutely. And I think it, there's, there's incredible opportunity. I'd like you, maybe Calvin, to comment on you know, even that concept. It's almost a golden era for the trust advisor. And you need, though, to think intentionally about what you want to do. I and mean, Barry just talked about a lot of different service lines. But the opportunity, in some ways, has never been better. Oh, I, I completely agree. And, you know, the, what we're seeing, whether it's, you know, using technology or taking advantage of, of even outsourcing some of you more, you know, standardized or automating standard processes, there are lower barriers of entry to get in there. You can be a, a one-person shop and you could create a very lucrative career uh, in areas we're probably not even thinking of right now. And technology will help you do it. Absolutely. And one last point, and I think yeah. anyone listening who's recruiting someone or, or coaching and, or, or developing a person that already works for them, we live in a world that is calling out for trust. You know, we have very few things in society that we can point to where the population trust, you know, from media to politics to religion to all sorts of things. Yet we are the most trusted profession. And that is something that I think everyone in this town hall can take away and repeat to the people that they're talking about, and it will resonate. That trust of business leaders to the profession, others that rely on businesses to the profession, is, is a really, really, really strong asset that we have. Well, we've got a lot of great feedback coming in from, from this discussion. Uh, Calvin, great having you, great having all of this, all the states, all the different societies together over the last couple of days, so thank, thank you. you. No, absolutely glad to be here, and you know, states are always happy to partner. Thank you. Thank you, Calvin. Good to be with you. So we're now going to move on to the DC and profession update. And Mark, here we've we've got a, a very kind of provocative, I don't know, <laughs> provocative. We got a headline here: "Buckle up." That's what we always do when we talk about uh, Washington DC. Is buckle up. And maybe Mark, you can all, also comment that every every year or every other year we bring council actually to Washington DC. And, and they play a key advocacy role as no, well for us. No, in, in May of every other year, right after the election, so we get to meet all the new members of Congress. Because uh, even if even if the sit, seat doesn't flip, you get a not, lot of new members of Congress, regardless, hundreds, actually. Right. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, we're, we're heading into a lame duck session. If you recall, Eric, uh, there was a short-term funding resolution to get the, keep the government funding, funded past the election um, to December 13th. Uh, but before that, if you want to talk about the election a little bit, um, right. before they get to that, they've got to figure out who's going to be the next majority. So I'll move to the next slide. Here's a, here we go. We got, so, we got some predictions coming for the town hall so, community. <laughs> yeah, predictions. So again, we run a bipartisan, bipartisan. program. Bipartisan. That's why we've, we've, we've had some partisan questions coming we, here. We have, <laughs> we're, we're very bipartisan. I call us all weather. Um, we, we can work with any majority. The, the reality is, is the agendas change and we have to work that way. Our, our, most of our issues are not inherently partisan. And so um, with, with the credibility of the profession and our expertise and, and the activity that we have, particularly partnering with the states, we, we have a great platform to start with. But let me just talk about this a little bit. So don't focus too much, uh, folks, on, on the, uh, the chart here because I'm just going to talk you through it. But I want to give you four data points on the... Um, House of Representatives, okay? Most of the time, 
Most of these seats are safe red or safe blue. But you do have, let's say, 36 that are considered toss-up. This is These are numbers from Real Clear Politics, which aggregates a bunch of polls together for what polls are worth these days. They've come under suspicion, but at least it gives us some direction. Um, and of those 36, uh, you've got five that are Republican and the rest are Democrat. So that is an indication of a headwind that's coming at the, um, the Democrats. Next number. Since World War II, the average loss in a midterm by the party in the White House, so in this case it would be uh, the Democrats, uh, loses an average of 26 seats. There's been a couple anomalies post 9-11 and things like that, but 26 seats. The current majority in the House that Speaker Pelosi enjoys is about 10 seats, okay? So next couple data points. If the president is polling below 50%, the average in a midterm for the party in power is a loss of 36 seats. Wow. Between 50% and 60% of approval is an average of 12 seats. That's still over the current margin uh, that the Democrat majority holds in the House of Representatives. Over, if you're over 60%, and we haven't had a president over 60% for a little while. <laughs> it's just plus three, okay? okay? It's just plus three. So those are just macro historic trends that we see that really indicate that the, the Democrat majority, particularly in the House, really is facing a headwind. Uh, and that would be true if they were Republicans too. So this is, these aren't partisan comments. It's just kind of stating where they are now. These races have to get run. Um, the candidates have to be good enough um, to, to win the election, and they, they're going to have to um, you know, make their final case three weeks out here. So then, if you take that, okay, let's move. So, so the sum uh, of that is that it is likely that the House is going to flip Republican. Most right. likely outcome. Anything can happen, but if you take the historic data points I just gave you, it's hard to see how the numbers are say anything other than that. Yeah, okay? so if the Democrats somehow hold, that'd be a huge, 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 huge victory. Huge. So that would, that, would, that would surprise a lot that of people. That would be a, a big surprise. So let's operate under the assumption right now that the House flips, because I want to come back to that. Right. Then let's move to the Senate. Now, Senate's 50-50 uh, Senate right now, uh, tiebreaker by the vice president. There's about seven seats, maybe eight if you, if you throw Ohio in there, that are considered toss-ups. Arizona, New Hampshire, North Carolina, Nevada, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Georgia. I'm going to come back to Georgia. Um, really, of those states, and then we'll throw in Ohio there. Ohio's uh, considered, at least in these polls, lean Republican, but it's, Ohio's always in play. So if you look at those, those seats, there's really three that are really being focused on. Now, anything can happen in the toss-ups, but are really being focused on. Nevada, Pennsylvania, and Georgia, okay? Mm -hmm. So for Leader Schumer to continue to be the Democrat leader, they've got to hold, either hold current status, so they still have the tiebreaker, or they've got to hold Nevada, Georgia, and pick up Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. On the other side, for the Republicans, for Mitch McConnell to become the leader, um, they have to hold Pennsylvania and then pick up either Nevada, Georgia, or both of them. And Georgia is probably going to be a discussion that we're going to be having for, for quite a while. So, um, you know, with that, a couple points I'd like to make. Again, even if both houses flip, it's still a, a Democratic Biden administration, mm -hmm. which means they're not likely to sign major pieces of Republican legislation. So there's two other kind of major factors. Let's say it's just the House. The House is going to have the ability, again, if it flips, to do oversight. So there will be a lot of oversight related to things like ESG. We've talked about, Barry, uh, a lot of focus on um, the, the current administration's projects and programs. And we're uh, PPP funding. There's going to be that that really is the power of the majority if you do not in the house if you do not have the the administration where you're not going to get much signed so a lot of oversight they will be able to have, they'll probably have depending on the size of the majority they will be able to vote in committee they will be able to have votes on the house floor it's just unlikely it moves past the senate and then to the white house right so then you move to the senate now this is going to be big because the administration has to get their confirmations through the senate Right. And so should it flip, 
uh, it's going to make it even that much more difficult for the Biden administration to get confirmations through the Senate. Um, and what we usually see at, right after a midterm is uh, some musical chairs in the administration. We start to see uh, agency heads and chairs start to leave. And um, that we'll, we'll probably, in a lot of likelihood, to see a lot of acting deputies that are moving into those roles until they can get through confirmation. One of those we've talked about in the past is an important one for us as the IRS commissioner, whose, whose term is ending here at the beginning of November. And they're going to have to figure out how they either get someone new confirmed or, you know, they move forward with an acting deputy. So, Mark, I mean, it, it sounds like it, it's been a busy couple of years here with the town hall talking about what's going on in D.C. And with this upcoming election, there could be more change, more change in the air. A lot more change. Yeah. And then so we get we get through the election, Eric, and then we go to the lame duck. And this was a slide that was used, I think, last town hall, yeah. which kind of tried to put what was what were some of the possibilities for for a lame duck session? Remember that the lame duck session is the last legislative vehicle out of the station. So this is the last chance to be included in something that is must pass. And the reason it's must pass is because of the 2023 appropriations. They've got to refund the government again. Um, and we've, we've, you know, there's been some bipartisan initiatives that you could see coming together in a deal. But just like that picture we started with, with the two leaders walking different directions, uh, lame duck is very challenging. So think about it. You've got people, this is past the election, so you have members of Congress coming back that may have lost election, primary or general. They may have announced their retirement. Uh, they may not be in the majority going into next year. So they've really got to decide how they're going to play out the package in front of them. Historically, my experience has been that they are, there is, there's a lot of buildup and they're over ambitious, and then it starts, they start to get closer and closer to the Christmas holiday, and it starts to shrink and shrink. So we've got some big things here for the profession that are possible. Extenders are always important to us. Um, R&D tax credit is a big deal. There's bipartisan retirement legislation that we think is gonna be a real opportunity for the profession. But here, here's, here's, if you're the Republicans and you win both houses, Maybe you want to bump that into next year when you have the gavel. It's bipartisan. You might be able to pass it even if it doesn't get the 60 votes to beat the filibuster. So there's an opportunity there. There's two other things I'll mention that could go along in this package. And, and we've talked about over the years reconciling the difference related to cannabis between federal and state. It's scheduled criminal at the federal level, but more and more states are, are legalizing it in, in some shape or form. There was just an executive order that came out of the White House that, that pardoned s certain examples of possession of cannabis. There also, uh, it also orders the administration to start the process, process for descheduling, which they can do regulatorily. That doesn't have to go, that doesn't have to be done statutorily. There is the possibility that that gives cover for adding legislation to this package, which has been passed the House several times, that would actually at least for, um, you know, financial institutions, lawyers, uh, CPAs and accountants that are working in the states, it would reconcile that federal state conflict. So that's something that we're watching that could be added to this. And there's also um, a defense authorization package that could get added to this. I think it probably will that has, and this is another issue we've talked about, it has language in it related to the delisting of Chinese companies. So if Chinese companies are not in compliance with the PCAOB, have had, had their inspections, they would be pulled off U.S. exchanges. So there's a lot to watch in December. Well, Mark, we've got a couple of questions coming in. I think I'm going to just throw, throw one to Barry. I mean, that, that was a great review of kind of, you know, looking at handicapping what, what could happen with these elections and the, the year-end deal. So, Barry, uh, some say questions coming in on you know, how, what, what, how could I best explain this to my clients? So if you're, you're there in practice right now, <laughs> this information, uh, what, what advice uh, would you have? Well, the first thing I would start with is, is and, and it's sort of I'll say to the, all the people in this town hall, uh, you know, we are, we are a country divided politically, and that makes predicting things very, very difficult. And the reality is that there are very few independents or people who, you know, vote sometimes Republican and sometimes Democrats. If you just apply that statistic, to the people listening today, most of you on here have an opinion about whether you want to see it be red or whether you want to see blue. And Mark started off with the sort of the, the we, are, we are bipartisan. We, we deal with these issues, particularly tax issues on both sides of the aisle. So 
that's true for your clients, right? I mean, if you just apply those statistics, even though, you know, maybe people would say business leaders tend to move to, to Republican in certain states, that's not true. And so I think that the, the reality is, is that I would start with the, just the math, you know, and what the trusted advisor notion is, is that I would say, look, we're a divided country. And so you have this sort of set of facts that will in many ways be decided maybe not on the best logic or maybe not on the best sort of business thinking, but rather on pure, hardcore politics that is in play in this environment. And that's very important why we, when we say we're bipartisan, you can look at all of those letters that we have constructed and we asked your help for over the last couple of years to the IRS, and they were signed off by members of Congress. We would sit here and we'd say, they're bicameral, bipartisan, meaning Republicans and Democrats from both the House and the Senate. That gives us a leg up when and if those houses change the next time, because we've been inclusive in how we've tried to bring and educate people along that way. And so I would tell my clients, if I looked at this list, I would probably not make big bets on these issues because as that pyramid shrinks down uh, and the tightness of the race, and Mark, you didn't come back to Georgia, but the reality is the lame duck will probably be even shrunk this year because in the very highly contested Senate race in, in Georgia, unless one of the two candidates literally gets 50 percent, there will be a runoff a few weeks later. And so we might not know the outcome of the Senate until that happens, which again starts to shrink that knowledge. So I would deal with my clients and being very open to say, look, tax issues, we you, because you're part of the profession, the profession on your behalf, we try to attack them on very bipartisan ways. And what we try to do is to try to make legislators, members of Congress, aware of the unintended consequences of some of the things that they are, or the, un, you know, the inability for some of them to be practically uh, affected based on what people are talking about. And I would share that with the clients because I think you being connected to that is a value proposition for your client, even though you can't make hard, definitive planning processes on any of these because it's just too highly unpredictable right now. And we've, well, we've got one more 2023 outlook. Real, We're probably going to have to hit this fast. Yep. And, and one thing I would say, Barry, is we, we would continue, like with the recently in passed inflation inflation uh, IRA. reduction act, IRA. I was gonna, <laughs> the IRA, that $700 billion bill, we, we had a session actually on it here at council, and that's probably a, something we'll be doing in a future town hall. It's just continuing to unpack some of those elements, and at times we'll put those in the technical updates. So there are things clearly there that you want that are, that are now law that yeah. you can bring to your clients. And, so, and we're going to, as this plays out, we're going to get a better sense of what, get to the election, see, we'll have a better understanding of how to handicap what the, what the lame duck is going to look like. We'll get into the lame duck. We'll be able to share the best available information right. with the town hall community. So next year we've got, this is just a small, uh, a small view of what we're going to have on radar related to, you know, issues that we're watching very closely. Some of these are very much thought leadership where the profession is trying to be part of the solution, like fiscal state of the, state of the nation. There's going to be another focus on debt and deficit, we think. Um, and then, you know, a whole series of other, of other issues going on. We're going to be very, very engaged on the IRS service issue. Uh, there's a lot of focus on that. We're already getting outreach about recommendations from Capitol Hill about things that, that we think could improve service, things that could improve the IRS as an agency. We need them to work well. We're going to have a real opportunity. And on some of the service issues and some of the big funding of IRS, which we've discussed in this, if both houses go Republican, there's going to be tr attempts to claw back there. Yep. But then will it be in a package that actually gets signed by the president? And so there will be a degree of uncertainty that comes through that process. Agreed. Well, Mark, thank you. Uh, this is the Power Hour. We're going to continue on. And we've got uh, Lisa Simpson, who's going to be providing a, a technical update. So welcome, Lisa. Thank you. All right. Um, I keep hoping my technical updates are going to be slow and easy, but boy, IRS uh, dropped some news this week. So you can't quite get rid of it yet. <laughs> this is really good news. So we have been hounding the IRS between the tax executive committee and the advocacy team, and we have been on Capitol Hill talking about um, these ERC mills. and Bipartisan. Bipartisan, very <laughs> focused on it. And, you know, everything takes too long and it's always harder than it needs to be. But we just got an announcement out of the uh, IRS acknowledging these third party promoters and imp their improper 
uh, promotion of ERC. Uh, they've actually setting up a fraud form. And so uh, this is really good news, Lisa. It is. It's great news. And I know that so many of you have been frustrated by the aggressive advertising that your clients are getting or that you're getting hounded with. So uh, this is a really interesting warning. If you haven't read it, you've got a link there. But it's basically saying, hey, folks, if it sounds too good to be true, it's not true. Um, it, this is a great resource to send to your clients. It talks about, at a high level, what to do to be eligible for ERC and um, some of the other issues that, that go along with ERC. But as, as Eric, um, Mark mentioned, it now has added, the IRS has now added a, a check the box to this fraud referral form, 3949A. So ERC is now added to that form and they've specifically called out in this um, issue number to report fraud and IRS phishing attempts to the Treasury Inspector General, and they've given you a phone number and a website to go to. So it, it really is great to see that the IRS is, is moving forward. And as Mark mentioned, we've been advocating for aggressive, more aggressive enforcement for a while. Um, we highlighted this last week, last on the last town hall, but it's such a great resource. I just wanted to call it out again. Our tax section is making this available for a limited time for you to be able to download and share with your clients. If that IRS warning doesn't sh scare them, uh, then you've got a fact or fiction resource to turn to. And it goes through some of the key elements of ERC, uh, shutdown orders, revenue decline, supply chain, stay at home, and give some really good examples that you can share with your clients. Um, last town hall, we also talked about a slate of disaster declarations and um, the ability for taxpayers in these affected communities to have more time to file. So this week, just on, on the 19th, which was what, yesterday, uh, we got more information from the IRS. And this relates to additional time to file for penalty relief if you, were, if you had a late filed return for 2019 and 2020. Initially, these returns were due to be filed by September 30 in order to qualify for that late filing penalty relief. But again, because of some of these disaster declarations that we've listed on the screen for you, you can now have additional time depending on which impacted area you were in. So good news for our, our friends in these areas. Okay, I'm going to read the slide on this one because it's a little technical. Um, but this is a question that we've been getting a lot around required minimum distributions. So in 2019, the SAFE Act came out with some new regulations around RMDs. And on October 7th, we got an, an IRS notice that gives some transitional relief that we've been advocating for. And basically what happened is a proposed reg came out that kind of caught people off guard that said that instead of being able to take um, a distribution in the 10th year for certain types of RMDs, you were, ha you were required to take annual payments. Well, this didn't come out until after the time to take some of those 2021 and 2022 RMDs was even an option. You'd already passed the, the opportunity. So we've been advocating for this transition relief, and this week we got that. It's, it's very technical, and you know we've given you a link to the notice itself, and there is a Journal of Accountancy article that just came out today that you can look to for additional information. Oh, um, so all that was great news, right? Um, this one, not so much. I know that this e-file shutdown is a pain point for so many of you, but I did want to go ahead and get it on your radar. Um, every year, the IRS has to shut down and prepare for the next filing season. So they have announced that date, and it is November 26th. So I know this is going to impact you if you're filing for taxpayers that were impacted by those disaster declarations. But e-file will reopen in 2023, and then you can proceed. So just getting that date on your radar, November 26. 
All right. Another, um, we talked about the Inflation Reduction Act and at council today, Jan Lewis gave a, a, a great look at some of the provisions. This is one of them. This is limited applicability, but it's around corporate alternative minimum tax. It is, it was part of the IRA and it is 15% on adjusted book income for tax years beginning after December 31, 2022. So taxpayers that are impacted by this AMT, this corporate AMT, are gonna need to know how to make payments in 2023 in the first quarter. That's also gonna impact their financial reporting in 2023. So the AICPA submitted a 40 page comment letter to the IRS outlining at a high level, some of the areas of additional guidance that is going to be needed for taxpayers who are impacted that, by this. I've given you, given you a reminder, this is only for corporations that um, have annual, that have revenue of over a billion dollars for three consecutive tax years. So none of my clients, but um, it is something to, to keep in mind. Um, we'll, be, we'll keep this on the radar there. You, you know, you may not think that it's gonna apply, but it will impact it could impact um, subsidiaries, it could impact roll-ups, so just something to think about. Um, I'm sure you have all heard that the applications are now open for student debt forgiveness. We talked about this on a town hall previously, and at that time they were acting like an application wasn't needed. They were acting like um, Treasury would just link up tax returns with student debt information and would be able to process forgiveness automatically. That has since changed, and now you are being asked to apply. So um, the application date closes December 31, 2023. But as a reminder, if um, any of you or your kids or your clients are um, taking advantage of the deferred student loan payments right now, that will go away in 2023. So the sooner you apply, the sooner that can be calculated in once payments resume. I mentioned this previously, but there is this special program for public service loan forgiveness that I think is huge, and I'm not really hearing a lot about it. So I, again, highlighting it for your attention to get with your clients. Um, the temporary changes under that program expire at the end of October. So you've got just a few um, short days left to apply for that, and that can be more generous. So if you've got clients who are teachers, firefighters, policemen, that might be uh, a program they can take advantage of. As a reminder, that is this cancellation of student debt is not subject to federal income tax, but there are some states that are taxing it, and we have a chart that you can reference on that. A few uh, town halls ago, I had Di Krupika come on to try to explain to me digital assets. So I wanted to give you an update on uh, a recent FASB tentative board decision about accounting for crypto assets. And at a, at a meeting on October 12th, again, they tentatively decided to measure crypto assets at fair value and also to recognize increases and decreases in fair value in comprehensive income each reporting period. So I've got the, um, you can go back to our September 22nd town hall to get a good uh, discussion on digital assets. I, there's a whole list of resources that we have, but the one I wanna point out to you today is because this FASB decision is tentative, right now you would still account for crypto assets as we've outlined in this accounting for it and auditing of digital assets practice aid. Um, it's my understanding there's been some confusion, so just wanted to point out that resource for you. All right, that was a wide range of topics that we just covered there. Um, so now let's kind of bring it back to some of the conversation we've had at council this week, which is around how work is transforming. I thought this was a great slide to help frame the conversation because it talks about all of the changes that we're seeing mm -hmm. in, in workforce right now, where you work, um, what your culture is where you work and, and who is doing the work is all changing, but it's all very connected. And in our conversations with firm leaders, with business and industry, we had, um, we brought to bubble up some of the, the top issues that 
everyone in this market is facing. This is not the accounting profession. Uh, your clients are facing these same challenges as well. But top issues are attracting and retaining talent, how to manage in this flexible environment where you've got some employees who are fully remote, some who are coming into the office every day, and some who are looking for that flexibility. And then what skills are needed in your, in your workforce and in your leadership to help lead through this change? So some of the things I heard, and, and I'm hoping you guys will pitch in on this, is that really it goes back to the conversation we started with, attracting and retaining talent can be a lot about outlining your purpose and outlining your ability to make an impact, especially in, in the accounting profession. And you know some of the best practices we heard, one, one that was repeated again and again is communication, over communicate, outlining clearly expectations, but managing to keep some flexibility there as well. Yeah, I think the other big one that came out, Lisa, on it was, and, and this is really a leadership uh, notion inside of an organization, and even in, in a small organization where you're working remotely, it's the ability or the necessity really for leaders to remember that they still have an obligation to manage and lead in those in those environments, to not just think of it as just a you know a person out there just producing without the normal development issues and training issues and expectation setting and of course the compensation that goes with actual deliverables as well there's this sort of tension that exists between how productive is someone in this environment versus being an environment in which i can see them now there are people on all parts of that spectrum right because people are arguing very very loudly that people in a remote environment can be more productive and there are others who say no they can't be and so the reality is this flexible point in the middle is very important, but as leaders, as partners in firms or as managers in firms, the obligation to actually lead, to coach, and to, to develop these expectations, it, just because the person isn't seen, that doesn't go away. And I think that that is a huge expectation and particularly another generational expectation. And Barry, the thing is in that debate, they may both be right because it really comes down to That's right. are the managers you lead, it's really, you say, communication. Is there is uh, new skills that are going to be required from the managers managing a remote team. And there is discussion that you'll have to be a higher performing team to be successful in the remote environment. So sometimes when the teams aren't working well, you might have to bring them back in the office to kind of you know get things sorted out and then have some flexibility. And the clear you know, message in, in the discussions we had here in Chicago and you have, you know, all, all the time with firms and companies is it's not, there's not one size that fits all. So this is, but there's, is, there's clearly going to be a hybrid environment going forward. And I think in the future town hall, we'll bring some of those best practice skills on really what the managers need to do when they're managing a hybrid, hybrid team. I think that's absolutely right. And, you know, there's sort of a rite of passage historically in our profession, particularly if in public practice and particularly on the audit side, that this sort of team notion of how you do an audit, even a small audit is generally not a, not a single person. Mm -hmm. and, and there is this sort of concern. I think it's a legitimate concern and it can go, I agree with you, it can go both ways as to how does that sort of experiential evolution for people, that judgment and discernment that's so important as you move up and do more and different types of things in an audit occur when it's fully remote. And, and, and I, th I think the overwhelming feedback is if, if in your flexible environment, that is a way people are working, the really emphasis, let's say as a partner in a, let's just say a 20 person firm, even a smaller firm, for that middle management to really do their management function, depending on how you've decided to structure it, becomes really, really, really critical when you roll it forward two and three and four years. And one of the tables, one of the breakout tables at council yesterday came up with the term osmosis learning. That's how you know, a lot of culture is, is created is, is through osmosis. But we had some interesting conversations with leaders of firms around the fact that for this one particular partner, she can't get any work done in the office. If she needs to get real meaningful work done, she stays home that day and then chooses a day to go into the office to be with everyone else. But that day in the office has purpose and it is intentional around the interaction 
with others in the office. It's not going into the office, shutting the door, and not engaging with the others. So, and you also heard that, that it's not developed. just like coming in the office and we're going to have like a pizza lunch. It needs to be, and sometimes, you know, we get some comments here on purpose. I think there needs to be intent and structure. So it's what, what you're doing. So don't overinterpret, you know, the, the word purpose. Right. But it, Intent's but, a better word for this. Yeah. For that. But in, so the, the intent of what, of what the day is going to be, what you're going to try to accomplish. And this, you know, this, this, is, um, this is complex. So that's, it's a little bit more complex than just when everybody was coming, just coming into the office. Yeah, and, and the other thing is the feedback we're sharing with you came from, is, is at least a reference to breakout discussions and tabletop discussions, but it, it came from really people from every state, all 50 states, and Puerto Rico and Guam. So, you, you know, you had a totally, you know, sort of diverse perspective and in geography, uh, size of cities, drive up offices versus, you know, um, commuting through transit type of capabilities all have an impact on this, particularly in, and, and frankly, a, a lot of unsettled things that are going on in society at large. And so it is a true, it is an, it's maybe one of the, the biggest mixed bags of an issue that I can recall because, because it is just people all over the place. And, and, and I remember a long ago, um, you know, it, a statement by one of our chairs many, many years ago, Leslie Murphy, that said, you know, it's, 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 it's what it's one size doesn't fit all one size fits one. Right. Right, so one answer fits one and each firm and each environment or each corporate really is going to have a different, a different set of facts. I, and I, I just want to come back because I use the word purpose and I think Eric, you correct. It's, it's a much better term to use intent. And I, I think it really goes back to productivity. If you're bringing people in two days a week, let's just say, what is it that we're gonna accomplish when people are in that we wouldn't be accomplishing in a virtual environment? And let's make sure we have a mutual accountability to accomplish those things. And therefore the coming in creates a different form of meaning for the people particularly even emotionally, if they don't want to be coming in, they can see that that value proposition in their own career advancement and learning processes. And the, the twist to that is you have lots of firms who have 100% remote employees who don't live within 150 miles of their firm's office. And so there is an, a, an intentional strategy that has to be developed around engaging with them and making sure that they are being developed and are given opportunity and are, are viewed as, you know, a real part of the team. A lot of, a lot of change management and a lot of developing out new skills, I think, is going to be needed. Yeah, I can tell you from a personal experience, my son works, my adult son works in a, a, a firm that does valuation work. And um, it is 100% remote. It was 100% remote before COVID. But I watch him and the discipline that they have to work is pretty impressive that they, you know, they're working eight to five and they're taking a limited amount of time and for lunch and breaks. And they have these, you know, these Zoom calls or whatever. And it, it is really meaningfully managed from that standpoint. So you have all types of examples in this process. Yeah. yeah. Any Additional thoughts there, Eric, or questions we need to? Address? Well, I, I think we all we all knew during the first year, first many months of the pandemic. I think we all we all were working many many more hours, so <laughs> it, it, there has been more balance. I don't know, if Mark, you have anything to no. add from what are the folks in Washington D.C. We're, discussing we're, about the hybrid environment? We're seeing it on Capitol Hill, and we're gonna, you know, like you promoted our, our May meeting where we're gonna have council back on Capitol Hill working on some of these issues that I outlined, but um, you know, office. Off, government offices have changed. Uh, there are a lot of the agencies that have not come back live, so it's 100% virtual. Uh, for, on the political end, Capitol Hill is much more live just because they're meeting with constituents, but not all of them. And they've also given their, their some of the responsibilities to some of the their staff that's in the state. So they're they're doing their jobs virtually, which is a different model for Capitol Hill, that's for sure. Yeah, I would just close by saying leaders do not get a pass in a virtual world from meeting their responsibilities to lead in the organization. Right. And I think that's probably the most important thing. It's well said, and one thing I do know about the, the leaders in DC, sometimes they've been more accessible through, <laughs> through virtual means. And the town, I, we, I said this on stage today, I think the town hall is one of the great things that, that came out of the, the pandemic for, for the profession and for the ASPA and for all of you that 
that attend. So you, you can connect mm -hmm. effectively using some of these, these technologies. And the feedback is very important. I'll just say this from a, a macro perspective as CEO, the, the feedback that comes in, and even on topics that aren't covered on that town hall, it is really part of our data uh, digestion process. And we've always had many, many, many different tentacles of feedback. Um, but this is a very powerful one. And so this community really is, is very, very, very significant, I think, as to how the profession evolves and what services look like. We have a slide that will show Lisa, show me. Lisa, we had, we had, a, we wanted to show the slide that we, we put up today. And this is, I mean, and Lisa, you comment after I do, that your, your input, your critical input that you provide to us every two weeks, 500 plus questions, you know, real time dialogue on our most pressing issues, some of them highlighted here. And, and it's just, it's a growing audience here. So thank you. And, and this was something that we recognized and, and we take your input very, very seriously. And we do view this as a collaboration. Absolutely. I learned so much about the, the pain points and the challenges, but also the successes that some of you are, are willing to share with us in, in the town hall Q and A. So we just can't thank you enough for um, staying with us and, and continuing to come back and, and give us that important feedback. So you want me to, uh, let me bring a couple of questions uh, to to the panel here since we're in open forum now, Lisa. Okay. So here's here's a good question, Barry. And Lisa, you you could add add to Barry's response. Just process to get involved with council, AICPA committees. You know, so starting with council and maybe. Well, I'll start broader. with committees actually because I think it's important. And and by the way, we have a, a leadership academy. Uh, where people are nominated from the various states and by their employers. We, and we bring about 35 per year. We've been doing it for about 15 years, so you can do the math. Uh, and, and part of this is for these individuals to become sort of aware of how of being involved in the importance of it. And then they end up serving on, on state society committees. They end up serving on our committees. There's been, they've served now on the AICPA board, some of the graduates of this program. Um, they've served on AICPA council in other ways. Committees is probably the, 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 first, the first line of involvement. Um, most of the committees that exist on a national level have, have companion committees, tax committees, et cetera, on a state society level. So we encourage that involvement as well. We have about 2,000 members per year that serve on various task force. They have a bunch of different names, task force committees, expert panels. Uh, technical resource panels and a lot of those individuals, some their thinking and their their materials, what Lisa brings or other people bring in these in, in these town halls. There is a there's an online process that you can volunteer for that. There's, you can pick from literally 200. There's 200 different of these types of working groups and say you have interest in it. And then those are sorted out. We get way more volunteers than we have slots, so it may take a year or two before you actually get appointed in that process. And of course, again, being involved in the state society level first is a good way to uh, to have a higher probability. Council Eric is, as I said in my opening remarks, predominantly, overwhelmingly, um, the, the members of Congress come from the states, um, usually from people who have served in the states and served on the board or in leadership positions in the states. Uh, and then they are nominated, the state societies nominate them to, to the council. There are 21, what is called at-large seats of council um, that are nominated through the AICPA nominating committee process, only 21, they're three-year terms, so seven a year. Um, and there really are, are people in those seats that, are, that have, they don't have the availability or where they work or whatever, they may not be, have the ability to be involved at the state level. Uh, and so there's a direct path from that standpoint. And again, those names can come through that nominations process as well. Well, thanks, Barry. We're coming uh, to the end of our hour. One thing I'll say, we, we talked a lot about the hybrid environment, but it's, it's wonderful being in person uh, with you and Lisa and Mark. There's been a number of comments here saying it's great to see you all in person. We do like being together. <laughs> uh, so let's just uh, talk about what's coming up. You see here on the November 3rd, our next town hall, we're going to have a leadership expert and former Disney executive uh, joining us, as well as updates on DOL independence and, and uh, guidance for employee benefit plans and, and our usual technical update section. It's not often you see Disney and DOL independence guidance on the same slide. So that's uh, 
that's going to be an interesting lineup there. It's two yeah. different topics. <laughs> two different topics. And we can, we, we, yeah, we have, we'll, we'll, we'll learn a lot of you know, good leadership uh, at many of these Fortune 500 companies. So we'll be back with you on November 3rd and then November 17th. Uh, we welcome you leveraging these materials. Thanks for your time today. Barry, I'll let you uh, sign off. I'll just echo the comment we just made about the, the, the feedback from this group. Keep it coming. Uh, we do our best to answer all of those things, but it, all of them are, are put into our data set. And so uh, thank you for that. And um, I guess just the other closing I would make in November 3rd, we'll, we'll have some election activity yeah. that we'll be able to talk about from that standpoint as well. And, and I know just from the comments, and I'll be really quick, I know from the comments, each one of you is probably not bipartisan you you have certain you know elements that you feel but i hope you recognize the importance of us for the profession as a whole to really deal with these issues as much as possible in a bipartisan way and maybe one day we'll really get back to a congress that actually compromises on things and that would be a good thing too so well that's all for now see you next time thank you for your participation you can now subscribe to the aicpa town hall series on your favorite podcast platform, as well as watch archives on YouTube and AICPA TV. Tune in for live broadcasts Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Time.